Hey everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're going to sort of wrap up uh, what we've been discussing for the last couple weeks, uh, which is probability and now expected value. And to do that, we're just going to sort of uh, give a little bit of a sort of theoretical discussion just to help you guys really understand what probability and expected value really means. In other words, the last few weeks have been really spent uh, having you guys learn different ways of calculating probabilities and more recently calculating expected value. And we'd just like to talk a little bit about what that actually means. In other words, all those probabilities that you've been calculating, what do those numbers really represent? I mean, we know that they sort of indicate likelihood or chance, but how do we actually interpret or discuss those types of values? So this video is gonna be more abstract than some of the other ones. There aren't gonna be any sort of formulas or any sort of um, computations that we have to learn how to do. We're just gonna have a quick discussion about the sort of meaning of probability and expected value. So let's go ahead and get right into that discussion. Uh, to sort of motivate this, we're going to talk about a very sort of important uh, idea in probability, which is called the law of large numbers. So this law of large numbers can be sort of stated in two different ways, depending on whether or not you're talking about probability or expected value. It's really saying the same thing both times, but we're just going to phrase it in two different situations. So what this law of large numbers says is that as you repeat a probability experiment many times, the observed probability, so what you actually see happen as you repeat the experiment many, many times, approaches the theoretical probability, meaning that as you repeat the probability experiment more and more, what you observe to happen will become closer and closer to the theoretical probability, the probability that you would calculate using all the things we've been discussing for the past few weeks. Now, it's a little beyond the scope of our class to talk about what approaches means mathematically, but for some of you guys, if you've had any experience with some calculus concepts, this approaches here is actually the same as what in calculus is called a limit. So if we were being more formal, we could say that as you repeat a probability experiment many times, the observed probability as a limit approaches the theoretical probability. But if you haven't had any calculus, then you can just think that the observed probability is gonna become more and more similar to the theoretical probability. All right, same idea if you talk about expected value. As you play a game many times, the observed expected value, so what you actually see happen, will approach or limit to the theoretical expected value. Now, this is a sort of abstract concept, uh, and we're gonna look at a couple uh, examples to actually see what this really means when we break it down. But what I'd like to just sort of mo make mention of here is that this tells you that probability and expected value are concepts that really begin to make sense when you talk about doing something many times, right? Both probability and expected value are really concepts that apply in the long run. That's really what we're trying to get home in this section. So let's go ahead and look at an example here. All right, so to sort of bring things full circle, let's start from the very first thing we talked about when we did probability. So if you think all the way back to the very first video that we did on basic probability, we sort of calculated the probability that when you flip a coin, you get heads. So uh, if you recall from the very beginning here, uh, that the probability that on a single flip of a coin that you get heads, the probability of heads is one out of two or 50%. So before recording this video, I went through and actually did 30 flips of a coin and I recorded the results here. So you can see my table here. There's all the results of my 30 flips of a coin. Apparently I have too much time on my hands, right? But we went ahead and did 30 flips and these are the results. Next to them, what I did is I wrote down what we would call the observed probability. Now, I'm not going to go through how we calculate all of these, but let's just look at the first couple ones. The first one, the observed probability here is one out of one. What I want you guys to understand from here is that when you flip that coin for the first time and it came up heads, what we've seen so far is that we've flipped the coin once and we got one head. That means the observed probability is one out of one. If we didn't have the rest of this information and we just had this first result, as far as we know, that coin always just gives heads. Okay, then we flipped again and I got heads again and you'll notice that the observed probability is two out of two. Then I flipped again and got heads. Now it's three out of three. I flipped it three times and it's been heads all three times. Then on my fourth flip, I got my first tail. So you'll notice my observed probability here is that I've gotten heads three times out of four flips. So the observed probability is three out of four. 
The rest of these are calculated in the same manner. The numerator is always the number of heads I've gotten so far, and the denominator is always the number of flips that I've gotten. So you'll notice that the very last observed probability is 16 out of 30, because if you go through and you look at this, during my 30 flips, I got 16 heads, and I flipped 30 times. Okay, so what is this supposed to really mean to you guys? Well, let's go ahead and look at a visualization of this. What we're going to do is we're going to look at these observed probabilities based on how many flips we've done so far. And I've built that graph for you already. So here's that graph. Down here, this is the number of flips. And over here is the observed probability. And I put a nice little line at p equals 1 half. Uh, let's put that in the same color. That red line is p equals 1 half, which is the theoretical probability. So what do we see here? Well, if you go back to the data, notice that my first three results were all heads. So I had 1 out of 1, 2 out of 2, and 3 out of 3. Those are all, if you actually do those divisions, 1 out of 1, 2 out of 2, and 3 out of 3 are all 1. So you'll notice that my initially, all my observed probabilities were up here. Then I got my first tail, and I had 3 out of 4. That's like 0.75 or 75%. Then we had this little drop down to there where I would have been at about 0.75. Then I charted the rest of those. And what do you notice? Well, you notice that initially there's lots of sort of fluctuation. You know, we're up here, then we're down here, and then we're more down here, and then we've got sort of fluctuation in there. But overall, that fluctuation is tightening. As you look down here, you're staying very close to that theoretical probability. Do you sometimes deviate away from it? Yeah, right? We have a little bit where we're above. We have a little bit where we're below, above. We have bits where we were below there. We started off way above it. But in the long run, as we flip this coin more and more, these points are going to tighten around that theoretical probability. And that's the idea of that law of large numbers. The observed probability is getting more and more similar to the theoretical probability. So if I had lots and lots of free time and I did 300 flips instead of 30 flips, well, what we would see is that there'd still be fluctuation, but it would get tighter and tighter around that theoretical probability. Okay, so let's go ahead and have the same discussion for some expected values. So we'll do the sort of very most basic expected value we did. If you remember a couple of videos ago, we introduced the idea of expected value with this game. So we talked about a game where you roll a six-sided dice, you won a dollar when it came up one through four, and you lost three dollars when it came up five or six. And we calculated that that was a bad game to play because its expected value was negative 0.33. And you can go back and redo that calculation or just watch the first video on expected value to see that. So I did the same thing here. I rolled an actual dice 30 times and I recorded the results. But I also followed the rules of this game, meaning that if it was a one through four, I counted it as plus one dollar. And if it was a five or six, I counted it as minus three. So let's see what we had here. So my first roll was a three, so I was up a dollar. Then a two, so I was up two dollars. Then a three, I was up three dollars. A one, I was up four dollars. Up, and then I got my first loss, which was a five. That meant that I had my four dollar profit reduced down to a one dollar profit. Then I got a four, which meant I won another dollar. Then I got a six, which meant that my $2 profit was now a $1 loss, and so on and so forth. And again, I did that 30 times. These are the re sort of results of what showed up on the dice, and this was my net profit. After doing those 30 rolls, it turned out that I was down about $6 according to the result of this game. So let's go ahead and visualize what this sort of means. Well, I did the same thing. I went ahead and plotted this, where this was the number of rolls, not flips this time, the number of rolls. And this over here was my net sort of profit. So you can see that at the beginning, I was on this nice little winning streak, and my net profit was going up. Then I had a loss, then I had a win, then I had a loss, and I was losing money, and then I had some nice winning streaks here. You can see later on, if you look at that data uh, on your own, you can see that there is a nice long winning streak here. But what do we notice overall? Well, this red line here is the line y equals negative 0.33x. 
which is saying that I'm expecting to lose about 33 cents per play, and X is the number of plays. So even though I have these fluctuations, right, where I go on winning streaks or whatever, I'm overall following the trajectory of this expected value. And that's what the law of large numbers is saying. There's going to be variation depending on if you're lucky or unlucky as you roll the dice, but overall the general pattern is going to follow the expected value. In this case, even when I went on this nice winning streak here, you can see that I still was losing money because I was following this sort of negative expected value. So in both of these, the idea here is that the probabilities eventually are going to tighten along the theoretical probability. And here, the expected values are going to follow what we sort of theoretically cal calculate as the expected value. Now, some of you guys might be wondering, okay, these are nice visualizations and things like that, but what does this really mean to us as we sort of move forward in our class? Well, the real thing, again, that I wanted to just hammer home with this is that when we talk about probabilities or when we talk about expected values, we always have to be very careful that they don't necessarily tell us what's going to happen in the short run. They're always about what happens in the long term. So to sort of summarize what you're seeing in these different visual displays in this law of large numbers, I want to just briefly go over some incorrect and correct ways to interpret probabilities and expected values. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So here's our sort of summary. Let's first start by talking about probabilities with coins again. So here are some incorrect interpretations of probabilities. This is not what probability means. If I flip a coin two times, I will get one heads and one tails. Sometimes people believe this. They say, oh, I'm flipping twice. I'm supposed to get heads one out of two times. So two times one half is going to be one. So I should get one head and one tail. We know that that's not the case. If you flip two coins, sometimes it all comes up heads, heads, sometimes heads, tails, sometimes tails, heads, sometimes tails, tails. You're not guaranteed to always get one heads and one tails. Why is this an incorrect interpretation? Because again, it's about the sort of short run, right? The probability is telling us that in the long run, we should be similar to the theoretical probability. We shouldn't be exactly the theoretical probability. So this is an incorrect interpretation. Now, most people, just from like a common sense standpoint, know that this is incorrect because we know that if we flip two coins, we don't get one heads and one tails. This second one is also incorrect, but a little bit more subtle. It says if you flip 100 times, you'll get exactly 50 heads and 50 tails. Now, this is more tempting because at 100, you start to say, oh, okay, that means like the long run. But the problem here is that choice of exactly. Again, if you go back to the visualization, as we go on, these sort of observed probabilities tighten along this, but it doesn't mean that they exactly fall on here. So this word, this choice of saying exactly is completely incorrect. If you think about it, the coin doesn't know what's going on. So as you flip the coin a hundred times, it doesn't keep track of how many heads and tails it's yielded. So it can't be true that you would get exactly 50 heads and tails. So if these are incorrect, what is the correct way of thinking about probability? Well, you would say something like this. If you flip a coin 100 times, okay, so a long run 100 times, you will get around 50 heads. In other words, if we flipped a coin 100 times, we'd expect something like maybe 53 heads or 56 heads or 49 heads or something. Maybe we'd get 50 heads, who knows? But we're saying we should get somewhere around 50 heads. If we flipped a coin 100 times and only got 20 heads, well, something weird might be going on. Maybe that coin isn't really a fair coin because we're expecting something around 50 heads. Now, the other reason I'm sort of really focusing on that word around, besides the fact that that's the correct way to interpret, is that that should sort of remind you of a concept we've discussed earlier. Right? Way back when we sort of started our study of statistics, we talked about, you know, we should have an expectation of what happens in a data set, which we called the center. We learned how to measure that using like the mean and median. But we said that you don't always expect the average to just happen. Usually there's an amount of variation, which we often measured using the standard deviation. And in the next sort of set of videos, when we start talking about sampling distributions, we're really going to analyze what do we mean about around. So there is a real important part about why we're saying that it should be near, but not exactly 50 heads. Okay, let's do the same thing with expected value. 
So here are some incorrect interpretations of expected value. So if you play that game we were just discussing, you roll a six-sided die and win $1 when the dice comes up one through four, but lose three when it comes up five or six, then you will lose 33 cents every time you play. That's obviously incorrect. We know that every time you play, you're either going to win a dollar or lose three dollars. You are never going to lose 33 cents. So this doesn't make any sense. Same thing here. This says if I play a game where I roll six-sided dice and win one dollar when the dice comes up one through four, but lose three dollars when it comes up five through six, and I play this game a hundred times, well, then 33 cents times a hundred is 33 dollars. This is still incorrect because we know we're not going to lose exactly 33 dollars, right? There's no way that the game keep track game keeps track and says, okay, we have to make sure that we lose $33. So what are the correct interpretations? Well, we've got to make use of those words like on average or around. So you could say, if I play this game and I roll the six high dice, win a dollar when it comes up one through four, but lose three when it comes up five through six, then I will lose 33 cents, not every time I play, but on average, every time I play, on average. Again, saying that that's what we expect to happen on average as we play this game many times. Or if we wanted to sort of reinterpret this guy correctly, we could say if you play this game and you play it 100 times, then you will lose not exactly $33, but around $33. So if we played this game 100 times, we would be very shocked if after the playing 100 times, we were up $10 because that's nowhere near losing 33 We'd also be really shocked if we were somehow down uh, $200. That wouldn't make any sense to us because then again, that's not around $33. We should be down somewhere around that $33 mark. So the real big idea of this, um, this law of large numbers is really important if you guys ever take like a full class in probability at some point. But for our class, I really just wanted you guys to see those couple quick visualizations to have a sense that probability and expected value are really something when we talk about the long run or when we repeat an experiment many, many times. And that's going to really tie into what we start to do next when we talk about sampling distributions and hypothesis testing. Because we're always going to talk about not single data sets, not single data points, but instead large data sets. Just like here, we don't talk about what happens on a single flip of a coin. We talk about what happens on lots of flips of the coin. So this wraps up pretty much everything about probability and expected value. We'll still be making use of probability as we move forward into our next set of videos, which is going to talk about the sampling distribution and get us ready for our move into inferential statistics.